Good evening, welcome. I'm John, I'm a bookseller at Literati Bookstore in downtown Ann Arbor, Michigan. We're so pleased to welcome Josh Mallerman back to our At Home with Literati series in support of Pearl and in conversation this evening with Jeff Milo. Just a quick webinar overview for those of you who are just joining us as our attendees. The chat function is closed to you, but you can keep the chat window open as I will be dropping links to purchase Pearl from our store throughout the event. You can also make use of the Q&A feature on your toolbar to submit questions at any time. And I will ask a selection of those questions on your behalf at the conclusion of the conversation. So don't hesitate to ask a question whenever the spirit moves you right there in the Q&A box. Uh, live transcription is also available to you as well, should you need it, as using the CC icon uh, for subtitles on your toolbar. And of course, if you're watching us later on YouTube, please be sure to look in the description below for links to purchase Pearl from Literati Bookstore. You can also like and subscribe to make sure you are kept up to date with all of our events when they become available on our channel. As a reminder, you can shop for more books at literatibookstore.com to have shipped to your home anywhere in the United States. And of course, if you live in Southeast Michigan or the Ann Arbor area, our doors are open to the public for in-store shopping. Most of all, we'd just like to thank you for your attendance this evening or this morning or this afternoon, uh, depending on where and when in the world you may be joining us. So without further ado, I'll introduce tonight's author and our moderator. Josh Mallerman is a New York Times bestselling author and one of two singer-songwriters for the rock band The High Strung. His debut novel, Bird Box, was the inspiration for the hit Netflix film of the same name. His other novels include Unbury Carol, Inspection, A House at the Bottom of a Lake, and Mallory, the sequel to Bird Box. Mallerman lives in Michigan. And he is joined this evening by fellow Michigander Jeff Milo, who's a music journalist who's covered the Michigan art scene for 17 years. He hosts and produces the podcast A Little Too Quiet, where he regularly interviews authors about new works and the creative process. When, he's in coordinate, it, when he isn't coordinating media, marketing, and events for the Ferndale Area District Library, he's a reporter at large for WDET's Culture Shift. Please join me in welcoming Josh Mallerman and Jeff Milo into your living rooms. Hey. Good That's evening, Josh. Of, How are you? Outstanding. And I'm exceptionally excited to be here with you. Hi, Jeff. How are you doing? Hi. Congrats on the book. Thank you. I, um, I'm trying to keep count. I believe this is 10 or is this 11? I, I think you're right. I think it's 10. This is the and, 10. It's Pearl. Uh -huh. um, and I... I mean, I, I don't want to get into hyperbole right away, but I think this might be your scariest book to date. How do you feel about that? Uh, how do I feel about that? That's um, that's huge. That is a huge compliment. For Having read all your books, I believe it to be your scariest. And, and to just open up that question a little bit more, um, talk to us uh, as being a horror novelist. I wonder if you see it as some sort of challenge or a hurdle or a trap or some sort of invigoration where you are um, more or less, if not tacitly, expected to up the scares book to book, don't you think? Um, because you can get to a certain point, do you feel like you can't, you can't pull it back, you have to almost up it. I wonder if that ever goes through your head. Well, th that definitely exists within the, um, the book itself, right? Yeah. So I, you know, I talked to a friend about this, um, fellow horror author, John Langan, and we were saying how when you start a book, often you'll have like four scares or landmark scares or something in mind. And then we, we were saying, hey, instead of spacing these out, right, let's try to open our books with these four scares sure. and then try to outdo ourselves for the rest of the book, you know, <laughs> as opposed to like quiet, 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 quiet landmark, you know, right. And, and both of us, I think agreed in that conversation. We're like, all right, that's what we're going to do for now on. And I have thought that way since then. Um, it's interesting, you know, sometimes, and in terms of book to book, sometimes like scenario could count. Like this is a freaky scenario, like inspection sure. or, or, um, uh smoke in unburied carol is sure. maybe freakier than gary and bird box that kind of thing so i think there are ways to uh try to outdo yourself sure. without necessarily feeling like you have to outdo the entire book before i think that's interesting landmark scares because i'm what i'm responding to and this is not a spoiler folks 
But I think I can say that this book gets scary fast. Maybe that's what I mean. Um, we, the characters are thrown into a scary scenario rather, rather quickly on the farm, uh, Copple Farm, right? In Chowder, Michigan, mm -hmm. which you have located near Goblin. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's what I'm responding to is that uh, it goes from it goes from zero to ten, and then you bring it back down. You're like a little symphonic conductor here uh, with the tension. But let's talk about this scenario. We have uh, a pig, a uh, male pig named Pearl, with um, it's it's a rather big pig at this point with a bad eye, and uh, rumor has it that this pig is possibly telepathic hmm. now uh what? he well all right no, no, no. <laughs> it's your book man. I know. <laughs> uh, and where the scares really elevate is that there are some local teens who hear this rumor and they come to the farm uh technically trespassing to investigate that and that's where things kind of go haywire uh because the rumors let's say the rumors prove to be true uh it got me thinking that there's the saying that you can learn a lot about a person with the way they act around animals. Sometimes people uh, are very disquieted and discomforted by being around animals. Uh, and a pig in general is um, cute to some, but very disturbing to others like me. So I guess talk about that, talk about where this inspiration came from and why why a pig. Okay, all right, um, awesome. Uh... Well, I, I think that one of the unsettling things that can happen with an animal is when when you recognize like legitimate intelligence in their eyes. And I understand I'm I'm a huge animal lover. So, I mean, all animals are brilliant to me and insects and everything. But there are certain animals, certain dogs and certain not just certain breeds of dogs, but certain dogs within just almost at random, it seems um, where you can actually sense a higher intelligence going on. And, and I think it's one of those things that um. It's a little bit, it's like in the eyes. Yeah. You know, and you can just, you, you just, when, just like when you meet someone for the first time and you, a person and you sense more going on than maybe somebody had met before or whatever. And so <clears throat> like if I see videos of like, like a whale checking someone out or like that, the way that they look at something, there's a sense of examination there. There's a sense of like study there. And that same thing is true of like, um, uh Weimariners, German Shepherds. Um sure. what, what's the um sheep dog, the the shepherd dog? Um Shetland? You know, the, no, the the terrier that's like so brilliant. Um I let's get back to pigs though. <laughs> no, but no, no, no. But and the same thing with pigs. Like if you go to like a farm or a petting zoo or this sort of thing, in any scenario that you've seen a pig, there can be this sense that this animal is examining me mm -hmm. he's actually checking me out in some way that isn't exactly like how i think but also isn't just sort of like you know blankly looking at me as as, as, as a life form that has entered the room and sure. that thing there that i don't um uh, some people will say like oh like a pig is as smart as like a you know um, a five-year-old or a toddler but i look at it as a completely separate intelligence and and, the, and that gulf between our intelligence and animal intelligence is interesting to me or the difference between and what Pearl does on this day is attempt to bridge that gulf. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is the day where Pearl, who's always had something special to him, something frighteningly special to him. This is the day where either he's hit some sort of maturity or some peak mental faculty where this animal is like, today is the day I'm going to explore the extent of my intelligence and and there's something really frightening about that if you're a person around there for i don't mean to go on forever but for a couple of reasons one is just the fact that like there's a sludginess to discovering just like walking for the first time there's a sludginess to discovering or playing with your intelligence for the first time the other thing is that pearl has every right and reason and he told him justifiably to wreak havoc on the town that he lives in. And so what a day to be, to be drawn to the farm. And in, indeed, indeed. Uh, that is what's so fascinating about Pearl as readers are going to discover is that uh, there's a mixture of curiosity, fasc fascination and menace. 
um, it is ex that is the best word for what Pearl's exploits are is exploration. Uh, how far can I go um, to that extent? Because folks, this is a book about a, a telepathic pig. Um, we always look at animals and wonder what they're thinking. You're taking it to the next level and thinking, what if they could get into our head? Beyond yeah. that, right? Pearl, Pearl isn't just making you do things. He's making you want to do things. Mm -hmm. And there's a big difference there. It's not just like, oh, I, you know, I did this. Uh, I don't know what happened. I lost myself for a second. It's the pig. No, you distinctly remember wanting to do that bad thing that you did. And Pearl mm -hmm. places that desire to do so in your head. And then mm -hmm. that's the telepathic pig angle. Just as a side note, or maybe it's directly down the middle, is that this was this is one of those books that was, um, and it happens now and again, is is harder to pitch. Yeah. Like the pitch is weirder than the book or something, whereas the book is better than the pitch, which you'd imagine you would want every book you write to go that way, right? You'd want right. it to be better than the pitch, but it doesn't always work that way. Sometimes it's like the greatest idea and maybe it's a little like flat the book itself or whatever when maybe one you read or or write even mm -hmm. but pearl there was something from it uh from the from the get-go with this one where i had a sense of yeah this is a far out idea and if i was at a at the bar like at the emory and somebody was asking me what are you working on i start describing pearl and start laughing like i did when you started describing sure. pearl Sure. And and it's like, oh man, what the hell? I'm gonna sound insane to this guy, man. <laughs> I'm about a telepathic pig. I was just trying to, to think if there is even one of your books that can be summed up in one sentence. And you know, you're not gonna make you self-conscious about that. You know, who says that's a bad thing? Yeah, no, I to I totally agree with you hundred percent. I do think that Pearl, like um my story, One Last Transformation, and the book I'm writing right now, those feel more like um like fastballs to me, fastballs down the middle. Whereas, whereas Carol, even Bird Box, uh, Inspection, they all felt like more like elastic, like right. genre elastic or something. But right. like, oh, I, re I distinctly remember like, all right, I had just finished uh, another book and I was like, you know what? I'm just, I just feel like throwing one right over the plate. And from the word go, I just really related to Pearl in this moment of self-discovery. Sure, sure. Talk about that, though, with Pearl and what also differentiated this from others. You, you talk about a sports analogy like fastballs, and I'm telling you, uh, oh, gee whiz, Josh, this is scary. Um, in that, let's follow that analogy through. In that fastball analogy, the reader is the catcher, isn't it? Um, oh, for sure. So tell me about how you pace your books, uh, how, you, uh, how aware are you? When you're churning through something like Pearl and it gets, let's say, super scary by page 50, how, how do you tell, tell us about that pacing process for you? Um, does that happen later in editing or are you conscious of it as you go? More, I would say in a general sense, conscious as I go, it'd be similar to like jamming with a band, right? Mm -hmm. And you're aware that you've already reached some level. And like, if, if you're completely all freaking out and peeking out, well, you can bring it back down and there's dynamics or whatever, but you have reached probably your peak, right? That kind of thing. There is a sense um, and a sensibility to this with Bird Box, it was the same thing of trying to maintain that single beat, that single note throughout the, I mean, uh, Pearl takes place in one day. Right. So to, to maintain that single note on the, the low end synthesizer note, that, that bass drum, those toms, just maintain that for 300 pages you know, and without losing that beat, without adding like a major chord suddenly, without making like, uh, trying to be too funny suddenly and you break the whole mood, right? Mm -hmm. Something like that. And so I think that in terms of the scares, the danger becomes mm -hmm. that if you like, um, it would almost be like, uh, like the walls of uh, reality erode completely by the end because you're like, I got nowhere else to go. I, you know, now, now, now everything's just crazy. And in right. a sense, the, uh, the end of Pearl is a bit kaleidoscopic, but I don't think it ever, like it stretches, but I don't think it ever snaps. Sure. And, and so I was, I'm definitely aware of that kind of thing as I go. Sure. Uh, there's a mixture of characters in here of all ages. Uh, there's younger characters like Jeff and there's teens and like Mitch. And I was talking to you about, um, wondering what's going on in an animal's head and 
well, some of the most terrifying things that you do is something really subtle is that you you you've become very good at putting us in the heads of our protagonists um and so much of the scare is what are they thinking whilst all of this unbelievable outrageous and potentially life-threatening things are happening in front of their waking eyes um you're able to slow that down and we get to spend a lot of time in their heads uh so just talk about that not writing dialogue not writing um that the you know snappy repartees but actually spending a lot of time it's so much more cerebral sometimes trippy sometimes very emotional um i'm just wondering what that's like for you in the creative process uh i thank you for pointing that out i feel like it's something that i um am aware of and am not asked of or asked about very often um, it's, that's like home for me is what Mallory spends the bulk of her time in this space that you're talking about. Uh, Walter Camp spends the bulk of his time in the space you're talking about. Uh, you're a voice in their head as the narrator almost sometimes, or you're embodying their. You their... know, I, I, I talked to my brother about this the other day where it's my, it, it really is that what you're describing right now is home for me. When you, as the narrator can sort of take on the character's voice, like it would be like, um. Like if suddenly, if there was a scene where um, Sherry, uh, Sherry's dad, or Sherry's, it's a scene featuring Sherry, and she starts thinking about her dad. And then the narrator starts asking questions as if it was her dad. Well, why didn't you do this? Why didn't you do that? And she's like, you know, oh my God, you know, and the narrator's like, and you know, she's plagued, blah, blah, blah. And it's not actually her dad, it's the narrator saying it. Right. So, but it's still, it's not first person, or it hasn't changed, right. it's her influencing or making the narration elastic and that's that's my favorite place to be yeah the exact term for that uh what i was reaching for fourth person fourth person omniscient or almost so you're not third person narrative at that point you are right. uh separated from the book writer and it's like you are on the ground with them yeah you know? uh again i've never i've never heard it put that way but when you hear me saying what you just said in future interviews. Yeah. Just, just, just send okay. me, I don't do a royalty or something. <laughs> sure. <laughs> let's talk about, let, let's talk about Pearl as a character, um, antagonist, uh, focal character, villain. Um, you know, do you think about these kinds of things? I think it's, it can be tricky when we think of the horror genre. Uh, we do think of, we have these archetypes to reach for, whether it's Jaws or Cujo, where the animals have um, become terrifying. Uh, but, you know, we're very much with Pearl. We're hearing Pearl's thoughts. We're growing with Pearl. Um, but Pearl has a bit of villainy going on. And, you know, it's not like you have not had outright villains before. Of course, it's abstract in Bird Box. It's not seen uh, in Mallory. Um, but then in inspection, we have an antagonistic element. And in Unburied Carol, we have a, a man in the black hat villain, straight up. Mm -hmm. But, you know, talk about how Pearl mixes in with your uh, conceptions of, of villains and how you think of him. Well, just like I was saying earlier that he sort of gulfs the intelligences, he sort of also gulfs the antagonist protagonist, right? Because right. you have Jeff, and Aaron, who are obviously completely innocent. Uh, Mitch, Jerry, Susan, they're all innocent. I mean, you can even argue everyone is innocent other than Bob Buck, who is just, just rotten. And I, I, he was the one character I threw out was like, like nervous, like, is this too arch? Is this too mustache twirly? Is this guy? But I had so much fun writing him. And it's that fourth dimension thing mm -hmm. you were talking about, fourth, you know, mm -hmm. perspective that, I had so much fun writing him and his relationship with his wife who, who buys him like a pink suit. And, they, and it's like, every, they're like so influenced by Pearl and in Pearl's web without even realizing it. And by the time he goes to the farm, he looks like a pig himself, right? And, but he's, to me, he's the villain. And so Pearl, it's not like um, the kind of thing to me where like the serial killer that only kills bad people. It's not like that because Pearl's kind of like going like everywhere, shooting everywhere at once. But he's also, he's also like so 
justified in what he's doing. I mean, this is like the history of like animal, you know, oppression coming out in, in like almost like a funneling out through the intelligence of one single pig on one single farm in Michigan on one day. And so he's completely justified, number one, in, in flights of fancy of revenge, anger, wanting to see what he can do exploring. Um, there's almost a sense to me with him, uh, sometimes with Bird Box, I would, I would say that, um, that like Tom says in the book, like the creatures don't even know what they're doing. They don't, it's not about what they're doing to you. They're like observing you as they do it. There's an element of that to Pearl to me where he's not out to like murder. He's not bloodthirsty. Sure. But at the same time, it's like for the first time in like the history of me and all my species, I, sure. we, I, one of us, me, I have power over you. And, right. I'm to, and I'm going to freaking play with that. So is that a villain? Yeah, I mean, I, he would be if you and I walked into the barn. But he's also a hero, in a sense, to yep. the history of animals. And, and this is where, you know, I'm vegetarian. And I'm now, vegan. Yeah. Oh, yeah, right. And Allison is vegan. And obviously, early on in this book, I was, like, very aware, like, you know, this is going to, uh, could end up on the shelf of, like, animal activism. I mean, you know, depending on how you do it or whatever. I was just very careful of that I didn't want it to be just straight up um, that or, or just so solely focused on that. I wanted to do it to be more focused on the fact that animals are as smart as us, can be as smart as us, and that their, their intelligence is just different. And in this, case, in this case, this day eclipses ours. This, was it like that? Did you have to temper your empathy levels to an extent for how empathetic you were to animals? Well, I mean, the opening, I mean, and I don't want to, I don't want to ruin anything. Well, we know, oh, yeah, yeah, I know. The opening you're... scene suggests like Pearl's not even nice to his own kind, right? right. So you're kind of like, whoa, you know, right away, you're kind of like, what is this? I was expecting more like, you know, revenge on the humans, right? That kind of thing. But that's sort of his moment of like, all right, I am above the pigs around me. Like, you know, not by some, it's not like he was bit by a radioactive spider or something. He's right. a radioactive Charlotte. Right. <laughs> <laughs> He's just like, he, just, for whatever reason, this he was born this way and here he is. And so I would be proud as hell if this book did end up in the animal activist, like sort of like sector of like, if somebody was interested in that, they would read Pearl. I would love that. But I would also caution that Pearl isn't, isn't only sweetly presented sure yeah i mean sure. not even completely justified but not necessarily playing nice as he's exploring himself right and this other thing is that we're not just we're not we're seeing the story from everyone's side there is um we get to see the farmer his daughter her kids and then these scooby-doo teenagers investigating a mystery uh at the beginning and we are we get to get into all their heads. And frankly, you're, you're telling us they are terrified and for good reason. Who has ever heard of a telepathic pig? <laughs> and they have been their whole lives. Like right. Cherry, like there's that story with her. I think her friend's name is Allison when they're younger and her friend's like, oh, what about that one? Because Pearl sits in the pen and there's that, that, that almost <laughs> side eye watching you walk by and you're like, oh, that one, that one knows something. Right. And obviously Koppel has been like the farmer uh, right. for those here right. um, uh, has been nervous about this thing forever. And so is Bob Buck. And so, oh, remember the county fair scene? Right. And that cop, like, he's like, when he sees Pearl now, he's like, I should have arrested him then. And he's not talking about the farmer. He's talking about Pearl. Right. There's yeah. something there. there. I just sent something. Yeah. <laughs> um. I'd like to bring this into the conversation. You and I have chatted about it before, but um, there's this, I guess it's, it's, I guess it's a theme or if it's a trope or whatever you want to call it. But um, when we are thinking of bird box, we are uh, trapped and we're hoping to escape. You mm -hmm. know, there are entities out there, but we're in a safe house and we are hoping to get out. Uh, we're hoping to move on. Maybe we can. And if we're thinking of, uh, Unbury Carol, there is a sort of pursuit aspect to that. There is, you know, um, and when we think of Inception, we are thinking of this tower and we're trying to get out. We have curiosity to get out. 
Pearl has curiosity to get out. It's continuing, Josh. Can you can you talk about this? Yeah, you know, it's the kind of thing you don't recognize a pattern. You can't recognize a pattern in what you've written until you've written a number of books, right? Um, because then you start to see phases and, and sure. patterns and, and what you're describing exactly. The river in Bird Box, mm -hmm. the trail in Unbury Carroll, I mean, you know, I mean, like even those, uh, the path, he calls it the path and Black Mad Wheel. Right. Um, but the train it, in Mallory. Right. The train in Mallory. It's, it's always this sort of like, and, and this is totally subconscious, you know, but, or as you're saying, the trapped in the world of Bird Box, the trapped on the farm and, and yeah. the curiosity too. I think that these things are, I guess it's like, it's more, I think Pearl is more akin to Carpenter's Farm. Yeah. Not just because it's, a farm story, but because it's like an identity crisis, mm -hmm. like it's mm -hmm. almost like Pearl ate some of the crops on Carpenter's farm mm -hmm. and, and is now in that, like ate, uh, got into the intelligence sure. in Carpenter's farm and already has the pig intelligence, which again, I would never suggest is uh, beneath ours, just different than ours. But maybe Pearl got into the like intelligence, the human intelligence crops at Carpenter's farm ate those and that's what's bridging this gulf i mean because there's an identity crisis of um all the characters too in pearl because at some point it's like did i want to do that or did pearl sure. really want to do that sure who who am i right now and and then and that all peaks out by the end and obviously carbonus farm is just complete identity massacre so do you think there's something about uncertainty and the unknown and <laughs> unpredictability that scares you personally i mean i want to pull in some of your some of your past here as being someone who was in a band that was touring and living on the road uh, for seven or eight years constantly um, and basically living a life where you sometimes weren't sure where you're going to sleep uh, there's something to that if Mallory's in the river she's not sure what's on the other end uh, or if she's in the train she's not sure what's on the other end and we're not sure what's outside if we get out of the tower of inception I'm, maybe I'm digging in too close, but you were living a life of uncertainty. I wonder if there's anything there. I'm psychoanalyzing you two at the same time. Josh. Oh, no, no, I love it. I absolutely love this. Uh, I think absolutely the two most- It's just something scary about not knowing what's on yes. the other side and what yes. changes when you get there. But there's also something liberating, right? It, right. Like a hundred percent, right? So so it's almost like the what you're describing right now is almost like, um, and this is not on purpose or mapped out, but it's like a built-in tension. Mm -hmm. Like to start with what you're describing yeah. is makes the scenario immediately tense. Mm -hmm. It's almost like having a great amp sound. Yeah. So like immediately you just plug in. Okay, now it's a matter of what I play, but we know it's going to sound good. Right. You know? So now, all right, let's roll. And so what you're describing has a ton, like has a ton of like um it like uh it's like a it's an engine propels this kind of thing. There's two things I'm super interested in. And one of them is the instability mm -hmm. of literally location and like what is next for me. That is, right. it's also one of my favorite. I mean, standing at the door of self-discovery, uh, I strung a song for anyone that might not know, like those, that is one of my favorite things, but so is identity crisis in terms of horror. Like the, the, the scariest thing I can imagine is snapping. Yeah. is losing, literally losing yourself for a period of time and doing something that isn't you. Yeah. And then returning to the you that you know and having to live with what you did when you snapped as opposed, oh. to, as opposed to snapping and, and you're never back. Well, then great, you're never back. What's the difference? But returning. Right. And, that, and that's the thing, that, that identity thing is in Carpenter's Farm, Pearl. Inspection. I mean, it's for sure and even black black Mule to black bad wheel to, mm -hmm. to, bad wheel to an extent you know right because they start to feel they start to discover that they're they lose agency the wheel of war and, and all that right. yeah, lose agency um so those two things psychologically uh inst unstable and physically like literally like you were saying what is next yeah, that that shit's a lot scarier than vampires to me right yeah and you know how would you describe Kind of go into detail about how you would describe someone who is under Pearl's spell. Uh, it's not sonambulistic, it's not zombie. But right. What is it? It's 
That's a, a great question. Um, it's not necessarily schizophrenia. It's not like a voice in your head. Right. It's you, but you, so you are doing something out of character. Right. But you are also aware that you are doing something out of character. So it's not blind, like zombified, sort of like, I'm going to kill you. Right? And you're convinced you want to. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah, Bob Buck puts on that pink suit. He's like, I'm going, I'm going to face him. Have, like, he should be like, wait a minute, this is evidence that I'm, I'm pretty far on the web right now. And he's like tearing up the road on the way to Cobble Farm talking about, wouldn't it be interesting to just like, boom, let the wheel go. Like, what, wouldn't that, what a rush it would be to just crash right now. I mean, mm -hmm. he is like out of his mind, right? Mm -hmm. And that sort of, you know, for me, that web, that is, again, it's like scarier than like a monster because it's it's like, not only is it you, um, I, I guess they, they're not snapping, but it's equivalent. Someone. But you're like aware too. Like, like, I feel like you and I would, or you would immediately after be aware or afterwards be aware, like Jeff was in the pig pen. Like right. immediately after, it's not like 10 years later, he's like, whoa, I've been in a fog. No, 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 no. Like while Pearl was pressing you, right, flexing on you, you did it. Right. And afterwards you're like, oh, but how long can Pearl maintain that? And, that? and that's a big part of the book too, right? All the stuff where Pearl is talking about satellites. Mm -hmm. You know, how many can he like keep track of at once? There's Jeff, there's Aaron, there's Sherry, there's, there's uh, Officer Han, there's Officer, there's Bob Buck, there's Bob's wife, there's like, you know, the, the delivery driver and start, the other pigs, the teenagers. It's starting to be like, the, 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 oh shit. Like I'm, Pearl almost like bites off more than he can chew on this day or, or it seems to worry that he did. Right. And, and, but like, does he want to, I, mean, I don't know. Does he want to have control? Is it some sort of God complex? Does he want control of these? What, where is his consciousness at? Um, I'm just trying to compare it to a toddler and the way the toddler interacts with uh, entities that are all around them. And I think well, it's, I'm sorry, I didn't mean you can keep uh, yeah, Well, they, I mean, it's, they're developing the same, I, but I don't know, we're, we're getting into semantics of how smart are pigs, but. Well, but th this is interesting because my, the, again, I've told you this before. The first horror movie I ever saw was Twilight Zone, the movie. And the segment that really stuck with me is Anthony, is the Joe Dante Anthony where the kid can do, he has like godlike powers. He can do anything he wants with his mind and right. imagines the house like a living cartoon, removes right. his sister's mouth, makes his uncle Walt pull, pull out, Walt's couple, pull a rabbit out of the hat, right? And that's like, that was literally my introduction to horror. And here I am writing about a pig, which again, we're semantics, but some people say is the equivalent of like a toddler and intelligence. Right. And here I am saying, here's Pearl. There's my Anthony who do, can do anything he wants with his mind. <laughs> um, well, tell me about uh, farms in general. Um, and maybe this also goes back to, to, you know, your past as a touring musician, because, uh, you know, 85% of what you see is just, rural green cornfields when you're driving through middle America. Yep. Um, but when we think of, I mean, there's all sorts of tropes I can pull from uh, Texas Chainsaw, Motel Hell, that sort of farmish area has been a uh, rich for horror. Can you talk uh, about that? It, it starts with Carpenter Farm and now here we are, we're back on the farm and farms are, um, I, they're creepy to me. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Well, I almost feel like, man, and, and you can relate to this for sure. It's almost like a rite of passage to like, uh, as a teenager in, the, in these parts, like be like, hey, let's take photos in that abandoned barn. Right. Let's take photos in that abandoned. Let's like, drive down that old road, the old yeah. lonely road. Yeah. Right. Let's just do it. Like, oh, like I, I remember being so thrilled, like with Derek, you know, when, when we were like in like 17 or something and talking about that, like, let's take photos in that like barn. Let's go in there. It's almost like they're like, for whatever reason maybe it's like sort of this organic isolation mm -hmm. they become like little like pockets little twilight zoney pockets yep like yep. when you drive by like even a farm that's not dilapidated yeah like you a farm and there's a sense of like there's its whole own little world there yeah interdimensional nexuses or something yes it yes exactly that's the title of the, the next there that's you go the title, that's the title of the trilogy yeah <laughs> so but absolutely i think that People that grow up, like, I don't know if a New Yorker can understand what could relate to what we're talking about. If, right. if he or she took a drive with us across country, they would. Right. And every time Alice and I go up north, 
there's some of that, but I really feel that when I, when we drive across the state to like uh, Lake Michigan, mm -hmm. there's just so much of like these, like, like, like uh, barns and in like open, like sort of like a lot of woods too, but like open fields and stuff that gives you the sense of like, Oh my God, any story can happen in any of these places. I almost feel like every book I've written, Bird Box, I'm Barry Carroll. I mean, even Inspection, the towers are deep in the woods. Right. Uh, Pearl, Carpenter's Farm. Uh, these, they all could be found. All those settings could be found from driving to De from Detroit to Lake Michigan. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right. Yeah. And they all have that isolated element. I think that yeah. I, remember, I remember reading Carpenter's Farm and for anyone who hasn't read it, it does flash between a group and then one friend who did not go. And that one friend, I think, is sort of in a busy um, urban center. Yes. Yeah, and I remember that being like, oh, this is kind of the first time I've been in a busy urban center in a Josh McClellan book. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I need to write like a city book, don't I? Yeah. I mean, I've lived in New York for four years, you know? I can't find a shadowy corner in, four, in New York. I mean, Mark and I one time went, went, um, went to like a sort of a hippie commune mm -hmm. in New York. It was like they, they had the entire like sixth floor of a building. Yeah. Like an apartment building. That's a pretty shadowy, like that's, that, oh, yeah. that's, that's a great setting, man. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I think do we know think what that is. Do you think you make that equation in your head that in order to put my protagonists in a frightening scenario and in order to make it a scary scenario, they have to be isolated um, in a way uh, or feel like um, they might have a place to run to, but there's no help for miles. Um, yeah, I think all of that is super tempting. I think, yeah. that, um, I you know, the, with the rough draft of Bird Box, and, and even, I mean, it's a landline later on, but there was ne there was no mention of computers or anything. And not not in a, this took place in the 80s, but I was probably like, I just don't even want to have to deal with explaining, sure. you know, cell phones and all this. Like, um, But later on, uh, the editors said, like, you need to at least mention that that stuff went down, you know? And I'm like, all right, fine. Sure, sure, but, sure. So I do think that there's something to that, but because we're talking about it, it's really making me want to, uh, like challenging me to do this in a literally like a, a, a populated setting, like sure. a bunch of people around. Like, what if this is this is fun too? Like, if you're in a scenario where you're around a lot of people, but you just can't talk about it, you can't bring it up. What for whatever that is? That that's an. I feel like. Then we got like two book ideas here. I'm glad that this is recorded. I'm gonna I'm gonna end up watching. This. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know what? Uh, what I also think is a, a strength, and this goes back to like maybe my second or third question. But let's go back to that idea of getting into your characters' heads. Um, I think it's I think it's a merit of the medium of books that wins over films is that we can't get Absolutely. into their heads. And that one thing to note is that. And this is true literally right now and through our daily waking personal life and business life. We rarely say what we're thinking, don't we? We usually do not, um, even if we're, we're scared. Um, you know, everyone likes to make fun. There's a little video of that scene from Troll 2, I think, where the guy has to say, oh, my God, the trolls are going to come to kill me. And he's right. saying it out loud. You don't say these things out loud, right? I mean, so... <laughs> These are all in your head. First of all, I love that you called it earlier the fourth person, right? Wasn't it? Right. The right. So I love that. I, I don't even care if there's another phrase. I'm calling it fourth person for right. now. On that those, and they don't happen the whole book. They, mm. they come and they go. And the, I don't think it's possible to have fourth person in a film. I, and if it is, like, oh my God, let's please make that movie right away. Yeah, sure. Because it's not breaking the fourth wall, although there is a slight sense of it because the narrator will suddenly be asking questions and stuff as if it's a character, but right. that's not the same thing. It's not like turning its attention to the reader. Mm -hmm. It's it's like possessing or embodying the narrative voice is possessing momentarily in the actual character. I don't think that's possible in film. And that I think is why the novel is ultimately home for me. Because earlier I said that what you're describing, a fourth person is home for me. And I'm always saying the novel is home for me. Well, what's the what's the difference there? And I think it's what you're describing right now. Sure, sure, sure. And, and unfortunately, that's the same exact thing that a lot of people say when they are talking about when they say some parts are unfilmable. Mm -hmm. That's essentially what they're talking about, unless it's a budgetary constraint. They're talking about we can't have pages and pages of a character thinking because we're going to do, do it over the top. That's not the same thing. <laughs> 
Um, and then let's go back to this idea of, of empathy. I asked whether or not you had to temper your empathy for animals, but what about your empathy for the very human characters that you are um, scuttling through the uh, fun house of terrors? Um, do you ever have scenarios where you've maybe taken it too far or put them into too much peril? You know, it's been there from, from the get-go. You know, we have so much empathy for Mallory or even Olympia in Bird Box. And I really feel that here, especially with Sherry, I think is one of my most favorite characters in this book. I, yeah, I, I, I feel there have been times where it sounds like, like I'm just saying this to say this, but there has been times where I'm like, am I putting Mallory through too much right now? You know, like, I mean, this is like, she's, this poor woman is like so serious and then so much more serious than I am. I mean, I would be the same way I'm sure in that scenario, but so serious about putting her through something, but not like I've read, um, you know, like brutal horror novels, like stuff sure. where it's like, oh, dude, like this is, you know, like literally brut saw brutality, you know, later saw movie brutality. Not obviously there's nothing like that, really. Not really. But psychologically, well, there are characters strung up in this book. Not a spoiler. Yeah. Happens early. Wow. Yeah. No, you're right. You're right. Animals. And that's that's why I said, oh, this is new, scary territory for him. Yeah. No, you're right. Um, and uh, yeah. But I do find myself like shying away from like Allison and I were watching like a TV show last night and there was like, it, it was, it was well done, but there was so much like gunfire right away. And like, and then brutality. I was watching a movie somewhat recently and not to even bring this up, but like the, there were like two rapes like early in the movie. I was like, I have to mm. stop. I can't watch this. Yeah. It's just, I, and it's not um, shying away from violence. It's about like what you it's like, I think that you can be both um, uh, heavy, insightful, philosophical, and also there's like, there's a level, like a levity, like a fun to this. Like we can get where, like we're, we're thrilled right now. Sure. And I, in other words, I don't think the only way to achieve weight is through like violence. Right. And oftentimes when I read of, of, of um, extreme scenarios, or especially with guns, I'm always thinking like, isn't there a more creative way to do this. And Pearl, obviously, I would hope, is a more creative uh, demise what he does to a lot of these characters than, than gunshots, right? So absolutely, absolutely. I've told you this before. There's never a serial killer in your books. There's never, um, I don't know, a, a, a fanged monster per se uh, that is has bloodlust. Um, we're not running away from Freddy Krueger in your books. There's um there's some weirdness going on and you uh, we and I have often talked about um and maybe we could elaborate here for people who are watching the the weird tale and that goes back to the 19th century that goes back to what's the guy Algernon Blackwood mm -hmm. and that sort of uh, maybe the, they were the early incarnation of what Twilight Zone did later where it's just a weird scenario and how do you react um not not an outright um, monster. I guess talk talk a little bit more about that because I when I started this book off I said Josh do horror novelists have to up the ante every time and right. you know when we think of uh, Mary Shelley Henry James maybe you've heard of them you know mood atmosphere tone you know um, isn't that isn't that also yeah. just the name of the game instead of and I've always been drawn to uh, one of the um, first like horror books, anthologies that um, sent me down this path in a major way. It was called The American Supernatural Tale. Mm -hmm. And it and it had, it was almost like a chronological, um, I think it was, I think it started with Poe and built up to like a modern writer. I can't, I don't remember the details much beyond that, but I think it was like in order. Right. And I, and, and that whole book was more what we're talking right now. And oftentimes the weird tale is really ascribed when something's unnameable, mm -hmm. unseeable, like Bird Box, right? Yeah. But oftentimes also the weird tale isn't um, like palatable. Right. It's it's like bizarre or something. And well, and I, Pearl, and Pearl isn't coming to pounce on us and bite. Pearl is also doing something that we can't I, put a name to. Right. Right. I'm, and, I, and I think that I, I'll forever, you know, I've always been more attracted to it's not, see, some people say like it's quiet or subtle horror. I'm like, no, I don't, it, to me, if it's like scarier, then that's like as loud as it gets. Right. 
you know, so 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 is loud horror like a bunch of like, you know, like zombies on motorcycles, like with machetes. Is that loud horror? Right. And like, you know, um, you know, like just the vague outline of like a, a hand next to like a leg, you know, in the corner of your bedroom for a night. Is that quiet horror? Well, if that's quiet, then, well, I guess I'm quiet because that's but to me, the volume is in the scare and is in the tension and is in the like uh, the mood. The atmosphere, sure. as you're saying, sure. rather than these things. For the record, I would love to um, see a bunch of zombies on motorcycles with machetes. And also, for the record, it's a border collie. It just, it just. There you go. There you go. Border see, collie is the brilliant dog. Now the next question is: Did Pearl tell you that? But, um, or did Pearl uh, stop me from thinking it before? Pearl was like jealous. Right. Indeed. Right. <laughs> but there is something to that. It's not the, it's not that it's not about the jump scare. It is about the thought scare, isn't it? It is about um, Susan seeing something terrifying from a distance rather than a pig jumping around the corner and saying, boo. Um, it is her taking something in and trying to absorb it and not being able to absorb what she's seeing. Are these pigs, are these pigs taking orders? What's, what is, what? That thought scare stuff is what gets me. And it is also what's going on with Mallory. Like, oh my God, what's outside? Could I lift up this window right now? What is out there? So. Whereas like Carol, Carol to me has always felt like more like Grand Guinal, like vignette. We've talked about this before. Where like each chapter, like the curtains part, it's two, every single chapter in um, Carol is uh, two characters that have not been together before in a chapter. So it's each chapter is a unique pairing in that way. And I think that, you know, I think that, uh, what's it called? I can't wait. I can't remember where this started all of a sudden. Wait, 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 where, where, where was this? Hot scare. Getting right. people's heads. Right. Mallory. Right. So. Pearl. Pearl, there, there isn't this, like the psychological, there is, but it's not the same. It's more like stay, it feels like theater to me. And it's supposed to be like, it's supposed to be like theatrical. Whereas inspection, Mallory, House of Bottom Lake, these things take place in that space that you and I are talking about. And by the way, Milo, this to me is the biggest link that I have to uh, music um, in writing. Because people will be like, are there, do you, you know, is there any links that you've discovered? And it, there is, it's what we're talking about right now, that mood of the song. Can we like stay in that mood? And, and if you leave it, then that's a different type of song. That's fine. But like, can we stay in this mood and maintain this through all the parts? And can it build on its way? And, and do we sing a harmony here? But the harmony, does it, does it maintain the mood still? Like we don't want just a harmony just for harmony's sake and that kind of thing. And that's, and that rhythm that I was talking about earlier, the beat behind it. So what we're discussing right now to me is has always been like the link. And, and, and I often think about, um, in terms of writing books, it's like, I think about Derek a lot because as you know, Chad played lead bass with the high strung for all those years, while well, I was more or less playing rhythm with Derek. Right. And I feel like when I'm writing books, I'm still playing rhythm with a drummer. And that's what we're talking about, the mood, the uh, headspace remaining in there as long as we can. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because when we think of horror and these scenarios of, of um, these kids or adults encountering this pig, um, or any scenario, it could be zombies on, on motorcycles, then the way that a protagonist will probably respond is sheer panic. So how do you um, pace that? Because panic can be erratic. So how do you even structure that? So Okay, man, the book I'm writing right now, literally, I swear to God, it's about um, the main character is, 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 it really is like a treatise on like anxiety. Mm -hmm. And everything that I know about it and have experienced it, I say that knowing that um, well aware that people like suffer anxiety in much crazier ways than I do. I have found anxiety. Um, I have found ways to sort of like use it as almost like a like a jet pack. And but it is a topic that I'm super fascinated with and familiar with. I'm working on that right now, a book where it's literally about panic and anxiety. Mm -hmm. And I'm discovering that thing right there, like are we supposed to build all the way up to a panic attack? Well, no, that's not really how this works. It's like a mountain range anxiety. Right. And we, and we need to, it, it, so it's not quite like the, like the, like that kind of thing that bird box is like, you actually need peaks and valleys with this. And you, and we, hopefully if you do it right, 
the reader will understand that even in the valley, like oh, shit's going wrong in this book. I mean, this is like a horror novel, right? Mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm literally juggling what you're talking about right now. That's intense. That's intense. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but again, I think that that is there. I think that's always there. I think when you think of um, for Sherry and Jeff, it's different. They have been able to encounter this pig and they've had their suspicions. But for the teenagers who are wandering under this farm, Mitch and Susan, that's they had no, they had no idea what to expect. That's panic. Yeah, no idea. That's, that, that's the most uh, Texas chainsaw moment <laughs> when the three of them approach that barn, right? And they're like looking through that back window, and then right. they kind of get like shuttled, sort of like into the barn, right? right. And that whole sequence is sort of like, oh boy, yeah. The the, but and I, I'll kind of wrap up here before I will turn it over. Is that when we think of when I when I went back to this idea of hoping to break out of something, trying to break out of something, wanting to uh, arrive somewhere else. Um, there is something, there's something scary there that we don't know what's, what's on the other end. And that when Pearl begins on this day, his actions, uh, he's to an extent learning as he goes. Uh, mm-hmm. He has no idea where he's going to wind up. Mm-hmm. Um, to an extent, he was sitting pretty um in a Mm -hmm. sheltered barn Mm -hmm. and that was a known existence uh where you could know what to expect day in and day out uh mallory spends four years in the house knowing day to day what to expect when she goes on the river she has no idea what's going to happen when pearl starts his exploits he has no idea where he will end up this idea of where will we end up if we get out of the tower and inception what what is at the end? That's the scariest thing, sir. Yeah, you know, <laughs> you know that's one of my. It's, that's that. First of all, before we do hand it over, uh, that's an absolutely brilliant thing that you just said, and thank you, Milo, for for all of this. I just wanted to make sure I said that um, before we hand over and get swept up, maybe in sure. or something. But one of my favorite, two of my favorite things that a friend can ever tell me are: number one, I quit my job. And number two, I'm moving to a new house. And the reason is um, because as horrifying as these things are, yeah. as the unknown what's on the other side, in my experience, a new phase is literally a new adventure. Sure. And I think that, you know, I literally just yesterday was talking to a friend who said he's quitting his job in a year. And I was like, this is amazing, you know? Mm-hmm. And I, I think that, uh, yes, that is reflected in all the books. There's a routine that a character breaks. There's a relatively safe routine that a character breaks. Mallory didn't have to go that day. Pearl doesn't have to like do what he's doing, as you described. Oh, and, Jay, and Jay and and Jay and Kay could have been like, we got we got it good here. Let's keep it this way. Josh, your books are scary as hell, but I think that we have found the seed of optimism that lives in them. This idea that a disruption can be an opportunity. A hundred percent. Yep. Um, that's great. Um, John at Literati, come on in. I think I'm almost out of questions, so I'd love to turn it over. Sure. Um, we only have, we have sort of a, a comment slash question, I think about something that you spoke to, you both were discussing earlier in the conversation then returned to very recently. And so I'll read this uh, comment from Alex and I think, we can respond to that. And I think that will be uh, about what we have time for. Alex writes, uh, doesn't the fact that internal themes or mental description that a story brings forth outweigh the need of pop scares or base terror? Yeah, I I feel like the idea that a story needs to be more scary or terrifying than previous work from an author lends well to a marketing department lines well to a marketing department, a publishing house, but flattens, for lack of a better word, the overall narrative piece of work. If how scary something is becomes a measure of the work, then wouldn't a horror writer be limited in both scope mm-hmm. and publishing by their ability to give the reader more goosebumps rather than meat, so to speak? Yeah, sure. Yes, of course. Jeff and I definitely both agree with that. But at the same time, I don't know if anything beats here and this is your scariest book. <laughs> like and, and, and it, for whatever reason that is because there is like the child 
who wanted, who, who love, fell in love with horror, who grew up to be a horror author, who is still sitting in this meeting, right? Or in this, uh, yeah, in this meeting right now. And, and he just wants to scare someone. So yes, while all these huge themes are going on that we're talking about, uh, identity and stability and escape and curiosity and new phases, all of that, if somebody walks up to you and you're like, dude, that book scared the piss out of me. I'm like, yes. Well, do, do comedians want to hear that their stand-up was the best right. stand-up yet? Right. The it's funniest. Absolutely. This is the funniest. Like, to me, that's almost like, um, did they dance tonight? At the, you know, at the show, they were dancing tonight. Yeah, they were scared tonight. Right, right, right. Yeah, but that is such a great point in the Q&A. Such a great point, though. Yeah, yeah, 100%, 100%. agree. Absolutely. 100% agree. Well, that's the, that's the only uh, question we have for this evening. Um, Jeff, if you have one more question, a uh, question you'd like to ask Josh. Otherwise, I just always bore authors with asking them what they're currently reading, uh, which Josh has already had to do for us. Uh, oh, well, this is kind of a this is kind of a future plans question, but I, I was curious for and for fans sake, whether or not Josh was going to commit to a, a farm trilogy. Yeah, I am. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. You know, I was thinking, though, it could be the third one could be an album. OK, OK, one, OK. Sorry. The third one could be a movie. You know, I, I feel a little strange, like trying to come up with it because I feel like it has to be identity crisis on the farm. It does. You know, it sure. can't it can't just be like, I, I think, um, because that's a bigger uh, proponent to me than the actual setting itself. So or you um, can turn Barn Party into a book. No. And then I thought of that. I thought of, I was like, is Barn Party the third? Can I count that? Maybe that song is the trilogy. I think it is. <laughs> But that was my my only question. But um, John, you you could ask a question if you'd like. Um, well, I think it's been a year since we, or a little more than a year since we had Josh on the uh, the program, as it were. Um, so yeah, I'd be curious to know what you're currently reading, especially as we've talked a lot about horror tonight. If there are any sort of emerging horror authors you're following right now, or books people should be on the lookout for. Oh yeah, there's a bunch of like emer- like uh, Eric LaRocca, Haley Piper, Max Booth. Um, well, Jonathan Jans is, I mean, he's, I think Jonathan Jans already has like 13 books out, but that guy is one of my all time favorites. And he, he came to, uh, he came to our house on a night that we, we held like sort of like a sp- spooky lecture and Jonathan drove up from Indiana. That was amazing. Oh. Um, what I'm reading right now is not indie, it's Elvira. <laughs> and I'm, Oh, looks like I'm halfway in. And, and it's absolutely amazing, as you've heard, or maybe you've read. Is this yours um, cruelly? Yeah, yep. This is nice. this is this is the new one. Yeah. That's what I'm reading right now. But I'm also like neck deep in a rewrite. So it makes sense that I'm not I, I can sometimes find it kind of um not grading, but hard to spend all day rewriting and then read a novel, but like a biography or like something a little, you know what I mean? Nonfiction where it doesn't have the same imagination to it. So that's what I'm reading right now as I'm working. But yeah, man. And, and, I, and I talk about, you know, the indie writers that I'm into and interact with them on like Twitter and stuff all day. And Ryan Lewis and I, my manager and I have um, a production company called Spin a Black Yarn. And we're actually trying to get a number of these, a number of these writers I'm talking about right now, the movies made. And one of them we did. Um, we Need to Do Something by Max Booth was uh, premiered at Tribeca, uh, in June or July, June, and, and it is in theaters right now. And so, and that, that's a, it's weird to call him like an indie author. Cause like that, that somehow that always like indicates like some sort of size. And I don't really believe in so like who's bigger than who, what's the freaking difference. Right. He's an author and he's a great one. And is, and he wrote the movie and we produced it, Ryan and I. So we are definitely in tune and in touch with that that horror, that indie, you know, that side of horror right now. Yeah, I was going to say, even though Josh writes constantly, he does also manage to read constantly and uh, you get a lot of books in. Yeah. <laughs> well, we've reached the uh, top of the hour this evening. Josh Mallerman, Jeff Milo, thank you so much for joining us this evening at Home with Literati. Um, hope we can have you in the store in the not too distant future. But uh, until then, hope you continue to be safe and stay well. And to all of our attendees, uh, we thank you so much for joining us as well. We look forward to seeing you at the next event. Have a great night, everybody. Uh, thank Take care. you. Been a thank pleasure. So, so much. Thank you, Literati and Milo. 
thank you. That was freaking awesome. Thank and, you, buddy. Yeah, that was absolutely amazing. And and as philosophical and as insightful as I was hoping it would be, I had to be sharp for that one. It was great. <laughs> thank you both. Take care, all. <laughs>